Okay, hello and welcome to the Polonsky Salon. I'm Daniel Tulloch, a postdoctoral fellow at the Polonsky Academy, and I'm very excited to be joined uh, by Pamela Hieronymi, uh, professor of philosophy at UCLA. Uh, professor Hieronymi has written many influential articles in moral psychology, theory of rationality, philosophy of action, philosophy of mind on topics including blame, forgiveness, trust, reasons, belief, intentions, and mental action. She's also at work on a book called Minds That Matter, which advances a solution to the problem of free will and moral responsibility. Today, we'll be discussing her recently published book, uh, Freedom, Resentment, and the Metaphysics of Morals, which I have here, uh, which proposes a new understanding of what Peter Strassen is uh, doing in his much discussed essay, Freedom and Resentment. Um, so hello, Pamela, and uh, thanks for doing this. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so let me um, mention that you can, uh, to the audience members, that you can post uh, questions and comments in the uh, comment section on YouTube and Facebook, and there'll be uh, time near the end of our conversation to uh, turn to those. Um, okay, so to begin, so since, since Strassen's essay is about free will and moral responsibility, and your book is about Strassen's essay, I thought uh, very quickly and in broad strokes, uh, it'd be useful to introduce the problem or the version of the problem that concerns us. Um, I should mention that in Pamela's book, in addition to including a reprint of Strassen's essay, uh, there's also a brief primer on free will, um, which is useful. Um, okay, so the debate is over um, whether free will and moral responsibility are compatible with determinism, right? It's uh, possible in a deterministic world where determinism entails that the past together with the laws of nature fix the future. Um, so the main camps or the, you know, uh, uh, are, you know, those who answer uh, yes to the question of whether responsibility and free will are compatible with determinism. Those are compatibilists. Uh, and those who answer no are um, incompatibilists. I mean, there's a lot of nuance in between there, in between uh, this, each of those positions, but those, um, those are the positions that are discussed in Strassen's essay, a particular uh, variants of them. But Strassen int interestingly introduces his own labels for these camps, um, pessimism and optimism, where the pessimist uh, is the incompatibilist and the optimist is a particular kind of compatibilist one who appeals to the forward-looking considerations of uh, responsibility practices as justifying them. And Strassen uh, proposes to reconcile these two camps in his essay. Um, given though that the positions are kind of opposites, right? They seem radically opposed. I mean, I wonder what Strassen could mean in aiming to reconcile the two positions. Because talk of reconciliation seems to assume some sort of common ground, but they couldn't be more radically, uh, it seems like they couldn't be more radically opposed. Good, yeah. Um, so what he says is he wants a, a, um, a concession, a, a formal concession on one side for, I, um, um, I, should, I should have the terminology right at my fingertips, but um, I think he's uh, thinking of them in very human terms. Um, so the, the optimist to, to elaborate a little bit on, on it, um, Sorry, let me start with the pessimist because the pessimist is the, the more natural position. Mm -hmm. uh, the pessimist looks at determinism, which says, uh, given the, the physical laws of nature, the past, the future is already written, right? It's already fixed given the, the physical state of things now and the laws of nature, everything you're, you will ever do is already in place. And the pessimist thinks, well, if that's true, we can't possibly be responsible because what we do is already determined. It's not us, up to us. Supernatural, uh, a very natural position for, um, for people to take. The optimist um, responds to that by saying, well, let's think about this for a second. Um, all the things we do in holding people responsible have very good um, consequences. It helps to hold society together. It helps to make things work for people. Um, and we, even if determinism is true, we wouldn't want to um, let society fall apart. We wouldn't want to let people no longer have the incentives that allow our society to function. So we have very good reason to keep up with our practices of holding people responsible, even if determinism is false. The pessimist looks at that and 
thinks this is creepy, right? Awful, terrible. They think that all, all, all that all we would be doing in that situation is kind of a form of social control. We would just be giving one another incentives, but that's to leave out the core thing about responsibility, the pessimist thinks. So the reconciliation is, sorry, and the core thing about responsibility, the pessimist thinks, requires that determinism be false. So the reconciliation is to give back to the pessimist what Strawson thinks is the core thing about responsibility, which he thinks doesn't um, require the falsity of determinism, but will, um, but is also consistent with the fact that it helps our society get along. Um, and so he hopes to bring the two, um, he hopes to reconcile the two humans by getting them each to change their position in a way that, he, that he's pitching as not that, not that large a change. In fact, they're, it's, they're, it's a really big change, but, um, but he's hoping that it's a, it's a middle position that he can um, put forward. Yeah, so there, yeah, at times he refers to certain commonplaces. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder whether, so he'll use the first person plural uh, uh, throughout the essay, uh, for instance, in referring to the facts as we know them. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could, I could just be reading or you know, putting too much stress on this, but it seems as if, or I mean, I, I wonder whether um, in refer, you know, whether we ought to think of this we as including both the optimists and the pessimists. Um, um, and then if that's the case to kind of move further into the essay, um, so one of the facts as we know them, Strauss and Holt, is that um, the quality of will that others show us matters a great deal to us. Um, mm -hmm. So what kind of thing does Strauss and have in mind in speaking of uh, quality of will and how committed to a particular view do you think uh, he is? Um, to a particular of what, view of- What quality of will is, yeah. Um, I think he has, I think he means something very broad um, and I don't think he's committed to anything terribly technical. So um, he uses that to bring in what's the largest legacy of this, uh, of his paper, which is the distinction between the reactive and the objective attitudes, um, which the, um, I think that's easiest to get onto if you think of pairs of attitudes that you might have in response to different kinds of situations. So if you go to um, drive to work and you find that you have a nail in your tire and your tire's flat, you're gonna be frustrated. If instead you go and you find somebody slashed your tire, you're gonna be resentful or indignant. Um, if you um, need to get across a, a, a ditch on a board and it bears you up, it holds you, you're gonna be relieved. Um, if somebody helps you across the ditch, you're gonna be grateful. So frustration versus resentment, um, relief versus gratitude, um, disappointment versus betrayal. These are pairs of reactions where the second member of the pair is the what Strauss would call a reactive attitude. So he thinks that those, that there are these attitudes, these human um, sentiments that we have specifically in response to another person or another mind um, that, we, that we don't, we don't aptly or we don't correctly have in response to merely inanimate objects. So we do, in fact, you might in fact resent your computer, um, but if you think about it, I think you'll think you're resenting, you know, Microsoft or Apple or somebody, the, the, the people who have done this. And if you resent the weather, then you may be, that will make sense if you think there's a God who has um, uh, given you the weather. So, um, so because he's interested in that distinction, um, he's interested in, in whatever it is that those attitudes are picking up on, which I like to think of as um, a person's take on the world and, 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 and their place in it and your place in it, or how you figure into another person's world. So the quality of your will towards me 
is the is this very I think of as this very broad thing of how I figure into your world, and when I figure into your world in a way that is uh, disrespectful to me or disregards me or is malicious towards me, then I'm going to re react with negative reactive attitudes. Um, whereas if you're especially kind to me, I'm going to react with something like gratitude. If you're especially kind to others, I might react with admiration. Right. And then um, you know, the way the world appears to you evaluatively um, seems like for Strassen, um, there's some kind of uh, norms through which um, things show up as salient or not. Um, so, so, right, so we are sensitive in our reactive attitudes to others' qualities of will and then take it that an important part of the uh, machinery, as it were, uh, Strassen's view is that there are certain uh, demands for quality of will. Uh, I suppose, well, I was gonna say, I suppose we could think of being sensitive to others' quality of will without demands, but it's, I don't think we should go down that route, but I wonder whether you can, um, yeah, kind of outline the importance of the uh, demands for a certain degree of quality of will or the absence of uh, poor quality of will, because uh, at least for the kind of traditionally classed positive and negative reactive attitudes, um, you know, the praising and blaming ones, those are typically, I take it understood as uh, yeah, responses on the one hand, the negative ones, the violations of the demand, something like that. Um, and then the positive ones as you know, exceeding the demand or something or something like that. Right, right. So, um, so Strassen in trying to reconcile these two parties is, uh, that, that's his primary aim, but uh, in doing it, he kind of by the by gives you an argument uh, that no general thesis is gonna show that um, our practices of holding one another responsible is, is illicit. So, so it's, a, it's an odd essay because it's framed as about these disputants, but in the process, he seems to very quickly think he can solve the problem of free will and, and moral responsibility. So, and the way that he kind of quickly thinks he can solve that problem is the topic of my book. Um, and the core bit of the argument um, of, of my interpretation is to relies very heavily on identifying the proneness to the reactive attitudes with the demands and expectations we put one another to, which Strassen does explicitly in the article. He says the um, making of the demands is the proneness to the attitudes with an emphasis on is. So, um, so the picture as, the, the picture you might come to um, the paper with naturally is, well, the demands and expectations are one thing, they're held in place by something or other. Um, and then we have these reactive attitudes that um, sort of police those. Uh, and that, that you might think of as the, the natural way to understand the optimist picture. So we have some standards and then we have these attitudes that serve to reinforce and incentivize the standards. Strassen's picture is instead that the attitudes and the standards are the same thing. <clears throat> that, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that there's something like the human form of sociability, which is to care about how we figure into one another's worlds. We're caring about that means being ready to respond with reactive attitudes and where to have a functioning society, this comes up in a different essay that I make reference to in the book, to have a functioning society, you need to have some minimal standards of what counts as respectful and disrespectful. So his, his thinking is for any human society, there's going to be a minimum set of standards. Those standards just are the proneness to the reactive attitudes. And given that you have a society that's working, 
Um, he thinks most of those minimum standards are going to be satisfied. And moreover, this is just the form of human sociability. There's no question about whether we're justified or unjustified in engaging with one another in this natural way. Um, so, so that's a, that's a like very, very quick and dirty um, preview of what the argument, what I, of the interpretation I give to Strawson's argument for compatibilism. But it, it really depends on the, um, the idea that there aren't independent standards um, to which the reactive attitudes are attuned, but that the standards and the attitudes are the same thing and moreover are um, the manifestation of the human form of sociability, which itself is neither um, open for ju justification, isn't open for questions of justification at all, any more than the fact that, you know, we breathe air. Nice. Um, yeah, so you mentioned you're drawing on uh, other essays of uh, Strassen, and I think I like about the book is that, I mean, sometimes discussion of freedom and resentment, um, you know, authors will focus, I mean, because Strassen, you know, wasn't primarily or wasn't uh, a moral philosopher, but they'll focus on freedom and resentment. And, you know, there's a lot there. So, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, just a feature of your book that I quite like, and it comes up uh, pr probably most prominently in your discussion of social naturalism is the kind of uh, context uh, or the greater context of Strassen's writings that you um, draw upon, uh, yeah, including uh, his work on uh, induction, which uh, I guess we'll uh, turn to greater detail uh, shortly, um, but um, right, so we have these reactive attitudes and they're, uh, you know, one side of these uh, are proneness to uh, demands that we hold one another to. And then an important part, an important part of Strassen's view, I take it, is that um, there, are su there are certain conditions in which we suspend our reactive attitudes or you know, don't have them in the usual way. Um, mm -hmm. And he introduces certain uh, categories, uh, which come to be called you know, excuses and exemptions. And then part of the uh, the story as you usefully kind of uh, discuss is that, you know, the general thesis of determinism isn't one of these uh, reasons and nor could it be. So I wonder, yeah, it, seemed, it might be um, useful to introduce these two categories, the excuses and the exemptions. Um, you know, there'll be a third category that'll be an important part of the story, namely the use of this uh, resource um, but yeah, to have, um, uh, yeah, uh, should perhaps get on the table uh, what these excuses and exemptions come to and why the general thesis of determinism, you know, uh, you can't plug that into these to get what the pessimist wants. Good, yes. So, um, so as the essay unfolds, Strassen notes the importance of the quality of others' wills towards us and introduces the idea of the reactive attitudes. And then he says, let's consider uh, the conditions under which are cases in which these are suspended or modified. And he first divides them into two big types. Um, the first type is our cases in which we were mistaken about the quality of the other person's will. I should say, this is my interpretation of these types. How you interpret these is important, and I, mine is a distinctive um, interpretation. But as I understand it, the first one is our cases of error. Um, and I actually think the excuse exemption labels are a little, get us into trouble. Um, so I've been trying to think of a different one. And error and exit are what I'm playing with, although I think that, I think exit won't really work either. But anyway, the type one are cases in which we were mistaken. So. Um, the person didn't know, so what they said wasn't so mean after all. Um, or actually the door was locked or the car broke down and so they couldn't help you or what have you. So you, you, you change your resentment or you change your gratitude um, because you realize you are mistaken about the quality of will, which your attitude was a reaction to. That's type one. Type two, it's not that you're mistaken. 
But somehow that quality of will doesn't matter in the same way. Somehow that malicious intent or that bit of disrespect is not one that you're going to respond to. Now, why not? Um, Strassen actually doesn't give um, a sort of unified theory about that. Um, what he does is to um, point to certain um, cases. And so he says, um, in some cases, it's because the person was having a tremendously bad day or was under great stress or he wasn't himself. Other cases are cases like um, severe mental illness or immature, being a small child. So he, he, he takes that second class, he then divides it into two, the sort of temporary ones and what he calls the more enduring ones. Um, and then he says, but there, and this is gonna be the resource, he says, but there's something curious we have to notice. We have this resource where the resource is the ability to not react to a poor quality of will to not to step out of the reactive attitudes and into the more objective ones, even with somebody who has a quality of will towards us. He says, we have this resource and we can sometimes use it as a refuge, say, from the strains of involvement or for curiosity or for therapy. And that's something I think most of us recognize um, that's part of daily life, that, um, you know, that, that family member or that colleague who is just an issue. He's just, he's just a, like, I, we just have to deal with him. Right? You can just kind of step away and don't, don't engage, don't react. So, so you've got the cases when you're in error, the cases where you don't react. Some of those are cases in which the person was having a bad day, they weren't themselves. Some of those are cases in which somebody has a more enduring condition. Some of them are cases in which you just use your resource because you have it. And then Strassen wants to say, so what would the truth would the, would the truth of determinism give us reasons of any of these sorts? Um, and he goes through and um, considers the first one, and he says, no, that would be the reign of universal goodwill, not the reign of universal determinism. If if we never had reason to, you know, respond negatively to people. And then he turns to the second set, and he says. Um, you know, I also remarked that we um, adopt a more objective attitude um, when people are incapacitated for ordinary relationships by um, mental illness or by being a child. Um, he says, but it couldn't be, it could not be a consequence of any thesis, which is not itself self-contradictory, that abnormality is the usual condition. And that I think is the key overlooked uh, sentence. And it's easy to overlook it because he immediately says, now this may seem altogether too facile, and so in a sense it is. So he himself sort of admits that this is going to look too facile, but he doesn't give it up. I mean, he says it, and he, and he says, in a sense it is. Um, but what could he mean by that? Right? Um, it is not a consequence of any thesis that is not itself self-contradictory that abnormality is the usual condition. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna say how people have typically taken this argument and then I'm gonna say how I've taken the argument or one way in which people have typically taken the argument and under which it would have some force is that Strassen has given us a kind of laundry list of all the cases in which the reactive attitudes are suspended or modified. Determinism doesn't show up anywhere on that list. Therefore, determinism is irrelevant. That's, that's one standard way in which people have understood him to be arguing. It's the way in which uh, Tim Scanlon in fact argues in what we owe to each other um, in his responsibility chapter. Um, it's a fine argument, but it depends on the claim that you've given an exhaustive list of, of the conditions under which the attitudes are. Um, I don't think that's how Strassen means to argue. I think when he says um, it could not be a consequence of any thesis that it's not itself self-contradictory, that abnormality is the usual condition, um, he means to be saying it couldn't be the case that everyone is an outlier. It couldn't be the case that we're all in the minority and that 
what he has in mind is that the cases in which we disengage, we shift to a more objective position, have to be the outlier cases. Why is that? Well, we have this human form of sociability. We care about the quality of one another's wills. And the standards that we hold one another to just are the reflection of that care. Those are the same thing. We will, we're committed to living together in society. And so, and here's the part that um, is extremely controversial. Um, those standards will adjust themselves to fit what's true, whatever's true of us, whatever capacities we in fact have. Those are the capacities that our expectations and demands on one another will be um, suited to, to suited to. If determinism is true, it's already true. Whatever's already true has already been priced in, so to speak. So it's not going to show that we lack a capacity to engage in the relationships that we already evidently do engage in successfully, which don't have, and engaging with one another in that way isn't the sort of thing that can be justified or unjustified. Sorry, that was a long, that was a long holding forth on my part, but I wanted no, to get out the argument. No, that's good, yeah. So yeah, the, the construal of ordinary as statistically ordinary in your uh, book is particularly you know, compelling, initially shocking, but in rereading uh, Strassen's essay, it really did, uh, yeah, make sense to me. I wanted to mention earlier that, yeah, another reason to dislike excuse and exemption is that it works really awkwardly for the praising reactive attitudes, right? So mm -hmm. we don't excuse the person who yeah, you know, that's true. does a mm -hmm. beneficial thing out of ignorance. Um, right, so I, but I wonder though whether so I, I, I like, there's something at the core of the idea that when Strassen means uh, ordinary, when he's talking about ordinary relating, he means something like statistically ordinary, but I wonder whether it's exactly that, because sometimes you, mm -hmm. statistic, you have in mind that it's usually the case in the, in the yeah. with, uh, but I wonder whether that's too strong. So, you know, imagine a society that's very much like ours, but there's a two to one ratio of uh, permanent four-year-olds who we continue to treat for their entire lives as we, as we treat uh, four-year-olds uh, to, uh, to, to mature agents. So there's a mm -hmm. two to one ratio of those. Um, so, the, so the permanent four-year-olds wouldn't be outliers, statistically speaking. Uh, they'd be in the majority, but it seems that we, they would or could remain outside the realm of interpersonal, uh, ordinary interpersonal relating it seems like there's got to be a way to take the core of what you say to accommodate that. But, but it sounds like uh, to understand it strictly as st st uh, ordinariness, as st statistically ordinary and usual gives you the wrong result for this kind of uh, case. Yeah, good. So, um, so I've been pressed on the statistical and um, here's what I don't mean. Um, I don't mean that there's a set of standards um, and the standards sorry uh, so one challenge that I've um, a good challenge I've had about the statistical is well you don't really mean statistical because what about the top Right? We don't exempt the people at the top. It's only the people at the bottom that we exempt. So it's not, the, the outliers aren't um, symmetric here. So, um, so it can't just be statistics. And I, that's a good challenge. Uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's showing that it, it's not the case that I'm saying that, yeah, we, we look at the center and that's the only people who are responsible. It's rather that um, we are committed to engaging with people in a in in a in the participant or ordinary way in, in the engaged way, um, and so um, we won't exclude very many people from that. 
the number of people we exclude will be negligible. Um, most of the people, most of the time will be included. Um, now, your, your example of the four, the, what did you say, four to one four-year-olds? I was two to one, but four to one two to makes one. it even, yeah. Okay, let's do two to one four-year-olds. Um, so um, I have a lot of questions about the, about the, four, the, the people treated as four-year-olds, but the, the general form of my answer, I think, is going to be one nice feature, I think, of this interpretation is that it um, allows for lots of variation between subcultures. So, um, so I think what's going to, I, I think the ordinary state of things in your imagined world is that there's likely to be um, a set of standards within each group and a set of standards between the groups and, um, and some way of switching between them um, in, you know, in, in a way that we do now with, with kids. Um, so, but I'm, I'm wondering whether the, I mean, it wouldn't be the case, sorry. What I don't think Strassen would allow is that there are half the people who have the same capacities and abilities we do um, that, um, sorry, two thirds of the people who have the same capacities and abilities as the remaining third. And, um, that remaining third just happens to treat them like four-year-olds. Where treating like four-year-olds, I don't mean being paternalistic. Of course we can do that. We can oppress people. We can be paternalistic about them, but, um, but, but treats them as um, um, in all of the ways we treat four-year-olds. I mean, uh, not, not as not as othering them, not as, but, but as bringing them along. But they're not, but they're immature. Right? So 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 the four year old possibility has to be sort of picking out some some narrower kind of thing that we're doing to the that that the, that the one third is doing to the two thirds. Yeah, I was thinking of it as just people have in the same way that people have kids. Uh, you know, the kids don't grow up, um, but still, since these kids are in the majority, they won't be outlier statistically speaking, although it seems conceivable that we would, um, you know, continue exempting them. Um, but yeah, maybe if we understand the, uh, the statistically ordinary as, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I see. So, so the thought is something like um, we're in some science fiction world where all of us have had four kids um, at the same time, and then they, they all hit four years old and then like get frozen. The, yes. And so they're just going to be stuck at four years old. And, um, and, the, and there we are for eternity. With, right. With four they kids. stay at home, they go to daycare. They're still, they're, I'm not sure whether there are other kids that, that grow up or, you know, mm -hmm. so there's, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, let's just fix that. And so they'll be in the majority, but they'll go to, you know, uh, you know, they'll be dropped off at daycare. It seems like, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, we could, you know, maybe they'll team up and the norms will shift in their direction, but it's, I think it's natural to, under, you know, we could just understand the society is one in which there are lots of kids, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so, the, so interestingly there, I, I, I really think that last thing you said will matter a lot, whether they're going to team up um, <laughs> and, and, and gain some power. Um, I, mean, I think it's an uh, an important thing about kids that um, they're little. Um, that uh, right. So if um, so, if you had a, a right, so let, so let me back up for a second. Um, <clears throat> um, one of the things I do consider in the book, um, I I contrast. So as things are, um, we take certain sorts of outbursts, certain sorts of forgettings, certain sorts of um, sharp comments as rude. But if you're out with your friends and one of them happens to get unusually drunk and says something rude, 
a lot of times we just overlook that. We, we, yeah, we, they were drunk, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's a case of exempting. But then I ask the, my reader to consider an entire society of people who are naturally equipped only with the degree of impulse control, uh, memory and attention that we come with when we're fairly inebriated. And my contention is that if you were to observe the, um, you know, if you're just to film the interactions, they're gonna look similar to what happens now, which is to say that the, the remark is just gonna be um, ignored, <coughs> say, but um, that won't be because everyone in that society is always exempting one another from the standards that we hold one another to. Instead, it's gonna be the fact that uh, given the limited capacities for impulse control, attention and memory, <clears throat> the standards are gonna to adjust to that society. So, so certain sorts of forgettings, certain sorts of outbursts are just not gonna be rude in that society. They're just gonna be a sort of accepted part of things, which is an illustration of how the um, standards and the, and the attitudes adjust with one another. So, so wh why wouldn't you hold people to a higher standard in that society? Well, one thing you'd be a pain in the, you'd be a pain if you did that, right? If you were constantly indignant about people who did things that everybody does, you're not, you're not going to get along very well, right? But the making of the demands is the proneness to the attitudes. So once people stop having the reactions, the demand, the demand shifts as well. Now you can see right there, that's the like, opens the massive objection to this, which is that it seems like, it seems to be a non-starter because it seems too relativistic. It seems like now we can um, end up with all kinds of injustice, but we can get to that if we want, postponing that. Um, uh, you can see how it could be a good thing because in, say communities for the memory impaired, you're gonna have a different set of standards. Among children, you're gonna have a different set of standards. Like the standards are, are going to adjust and you're gonna end up with a fair amount of subcultures um, and then some indeterminacy in between them. Um, so in your situation, um, it seems to me one thing to say is that, that, you know, we would have, as we do sometimes have subcultures that are, that are larger and smaller. Um, and then ordinary is going to be relative to those. Um, now, if you zoom out, can you say something about what's ordinary overall? Um, you know, what's ordinary overall is that you have these different subcultures that people are moving in and out of. Um, do they put pressure on one another? That's the question about whether the kids will all gang up on us. Um, and I think they can. And that's the, you know, th that opens up the, the issue about relativism. Fortunately, that's not our world. I mean, I don't, I see the relativist, uh, relativistic worry. I don't personally have it. So I, I, yeah, I take it to be a virtue of the view that the standards will adjust relative to the capacities uh, of the agents uh, in the community for their, reasons um, you mentioned, even, you know, locally within a, one particular moral mm -hmm. community construed you know, pretty broadly, you'll have, as you mentioned, yeah, with different uh, norms, for, you know, within uh, nursing homes and the like. Um, so, but you're not worried that, um, that you could end up with horrible, horrible oppression, just normalized. That seems I'm, very worrying to me. I'm, you know, I think it, can, it might be, you know, we might be able to deal with it in other ways. So in the same way that you okay. can respond to the kind of internalist about reasons with, well, you open the door for saying this guy has no reasons not to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the kind of theoretical virtues of going the route that gives you the relativism kind of outweigh. I mean, I have, yeah, practical worries, but in terms of the theoretical motivation, it seems like um, the right way to go, albeit, yeah tragic, but you know, potentially tragic, but reveals uh, the truth of the potential tragedy of uh, the, you know, 
social dynamics. Um, right, so, um, so Strassen is opposed to what you call the generalization strategy, uh -huh. um, right, where we could go from uh, the way in which we exempt uh, abnormal agents and think that, well, if determinism is true, uh, uh, you know, we could, uh, we might extend that, uh, you know, to, to all agents. And he says that, you know, neither in the case of the normal, nor in the case of the abnormal, is it true that when we adopt the objective attitude, we do so because we hold this belief in determinism. Uh, I mean, one worry I have is that, so one of the exempting conditions he introduces, and maybe he's just you know, we should kind of cross it from the list is uh, being of unfortunate formative circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like the, the route from that to cut to determinism is pretty short. So if I exempt an agent because, uh, yeah, you know, in view of his uh, horrid upbringing, it just seems like, well, it's, of course, he'll do these, he'll, he'll be doing these horrible things. It seems like once I start viewing agents under that lens, what I'm doing, you know, I, you know, uh, yeah, it seems like that uh, kind of looking down the causal history. Um, I mean, of course, we can't literally look uh, down it. But uh, yeah, I wonder uh -huh. uh, whether yeah, the generalization strategy might get some purchase by latching on to that particular um, exemption. And then we can talk about whether, well, uh, Strauss and Otten have included that as an exempting condition or whether even if we do include it, it doesn't really help the generalization strategy as I'm suggesting it might. Um, good. Um, so so when I introduced the, um, the type two uh, quote unquote exemptions. I said, Strassen doesn't really give us a unifying characterization of them. Um, the, the closest, I, I mean, he doesn't do it at that point. Later, he said, he, he talks about being incapacitated for ordinary interpersonal relationships. And, um, and I think that's the right way to understand what holds together the more enduring of the type two cases. So, which includes, um, um, uh, serious mental illness, immaturity, and then we'd have to put here uh, the unfortunate formative circumstances. In each of those cases, I think he thinks they are exempting only insofar as they incapacitate the person for ordinary interpersonal relationships. So, um, so if you take a, I mean, so I'm going to say about the, sorry, I agree with you that the, um, unfortunate formative circumstances really opens the door to sort of thinking about, well, wait, um, that person didn't have any control over their childhood. They didn't have any control over their history. So how could they have control over what they're doing? And now you think, but that's true of all of us. And there we're in the generalization strategy. And now we have the skepticism of the pessimism, of the pessimist. Um, the, the case that I go through in the book, I think, is going to be an exact parallel to that one. It's the case of a um, impulse control disorder. So someone who has a who has a sort of debilitating in, impulse control disorder. Um, um, you might think, well, we excuse that person, and we excuse that person because what they do is a fun is just a function of their uh, physiology. But of course, for all of us, what we do is a function of our physiology. So we should excuse everyone. There's the generalization strategy again. I think in both cases, Strassen's going to say, um, no, we excuse people um, when their behavior is a function of their physiology um, in such a way as to incapacitate them for ordinary and personal, ordinary interpersonal relationships, or when somebody's formative circumstances were so unfortunate as to incapacitate them for ordinary interpersonal relationships, where incapacitate them for ordinary interpersonal relationships. All that means, I think, for Strassen is that it's not, it's not tolerably workable for us to engage with that, with the person in the ordinary way. And so we opt out or, or we opt out is the wrong way to put it. So we step out. Um, right. Yeah. So there, yeah, there might be a way of understanding the exemptions as you know, not 
you know, not even targeting the, the fact that the agent had unfortunate circumstances. I mean, that might be the explanation, but it seems like, you know, the reason we exempt them is something like, yeah, what you mentioned, that they're, they're incapable of uh, ordinary interpersonal uh, relating. How we know this is, you know, in virtue of their really horrid, unfortunate circumstances, but it's... Um, well, that's what explains. That's what that's what underlies it. That's the background to it. Yeah. So, and, and this is related to um, um, to to one of the things I think is is interesting, which is um, so I think that Strawson's. Um, oh, sorry. I now see that it's a quarter of. So maybe I should not launch into a whole other thing, and because I think we wanted. Did you want to do some times for questions? Uh, if there are any, it looks like at present there aren't, so we can we can carry on. Okay, then I'll launch into my thing. Um, so, um, so uh, Strawson's argument seems to leap open the possibility that. Um, um, sorry. He thinks of our practices of holding one another responsible as a um, product in a way of life as we live it. So it's the natural human sociability plus, you know, how we've in fact arranged ourselves. Um, and that leaves open a challenge that he doesn't consider, uh, which is somebody who says, look, we have for centuries thought of ourselves as spirits in a material world, as countercausal uh, countercausally free agents, and that itself has been built into our uh, beliefs and our attitudes about responsibility. So that that itself is part of these attitudes that you're talking about. And when we, when physics then tells us that we are not spirits living in a material, or when science tells us that we're not spirits living in a material world, that we can understand everything that we do. Um, uh, as explained by what has come before, then we should realize that we're not actually responsible. And I think Strawson's um, reaction to this um, is to say, well, hold on. Um, when we learned what, what science taught us, when it taught us that um, we are not spirits in a material world, we, we, we didn't only learn that we were mistaken about our position in the material world, we should also understand that we were, we were mistaken about the conditions for being responsible. Because it turns out that it's not that you have to be um, free from your physiology in order to be responsible. You just have to be, um, have a physiology that makes it possible for you to engage in ordinary interpersonal relationships. Um, so, and, and, and in each, each case, I think, in which somebody tries to launch the general's ad generalization strategy, I think that's going to be his answer. That it's, um, it, that, that, that in fact, what we're, we need is just enough to do what we already do. Right. Um, so the resource has come up and I wanna ask you more about it. Um, so right, so Strassen treats the crucial objection and uh, as, uh, you know, roughly, even if we wouldn't and in some sense couldn't uh, use the resource of, you know, kind of opting into the objective attitude, you know, which we, which we can do, you know, with the annoying uh, uncle or kind of out of curiosity. Um, you know, there's this question, well, should we, uh, if it turns out determinism is true, um, do that, um, I mean, but I have a kind of background question about what we're doing when we're using the, the or sorry, when we're, when we're using this resource, uh, um, you know, when we're suspending our, our ordinary engaging because you know, our, our feeling of, are we suspending our feeling of the reactive attitudes or their expression? Um, if it's the former, then that would seem to suggest the kind of voluntaristic picture of the reactive attitudes, which uh, I know you're uh, not into, and I don't think, mm -hmm. well, Strassen says less about it, but I take it here. Also mm -hmm. wouldn't be into that. Um, but if it's the latter, namely that it's the 
expression of the reactive attitudes that we're suspending, then, then it looks like the use of the resource is very different from exemption. Because then right. when we exempt an agent, we fail to feel the reactive attitude because we right. view and presumably believe, uh, and which we don't when we use the resource, believe that the agent is not beholden to the relevant demands. Um, so yeah, I'm worried about this because sometimes it sounds like the resource kind of switch this, we flip the switch and now we could have, but what, mm -hmm. are you, what do you think where, or what, what, uh, what do you think Strassen thinks uh, uh, we're doing when we're using this the resource? Um, I think he does think of it as something we can use kind of voluntarily. Mm. Um, so, uh, and you're right that in my other work, um, I shouldn't like that. Um, I should think that's not, not so. Um, I think it's kind of fascinating uh, because I do think that we are able to kind of pull ourselves away from it somehow. But, and Strassen's very clear that he agrees with this, that it it's a lot of work and it's not something we can do for very long or very well. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, I, that might be enough to answer your, the question you just asked. Maybe I'm, yeah, it's maybe it's something like aspect perception where it's, it's, it's some sort of attentional thing that we're controlling. So in the same way that, you know, we wouldn't say that seeing is voluntary, but I can kind of exert some effort, whether I see the, Good, Duck yeah. Or the rabbit, something maybe along those lines. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and, and he, I mean, Strassen says some interesting things about like that. That it's, um, he says something like, uh, as though it's a tension between our rationality and our humanity. Though, though to say so would distort both both notions, mm -hmm. right? That we, that we, um, we are able to. Um, pretend maybe, um, you know, that, um, it's, it's, anyway, so I, um, but I, I feel like I dropped the first part of your question about the role the resource was playing, but, but maybe, maybe. No, that, that, that what we're doing, well, yeah, the, the, the role that it's doing, we should come to pretty, uh, uh, so in a second, there is one question, uh, cause I okay. want to discuss, yeah. uh, uh, to, you know, the social, naturalism, and then your own interesting variant, the existentialist variant. But first, a uh, question from Leora Dahan Katz. Uh, right, so she writes that, uh, but are those uh, the same senses of responsibility pre and post the scientific revelation? Or are the optimist and pessimist now just talking past each other about two different uh, concepts of responsibility? Oh, I see. She's referring to the yeah, spiritual. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think, um, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> that is to say, I think they're partly talking past one another um, and partly not. Uh, so um, th th now I'm speaking for myself, I'm not interpreting Strassen, but, uh, but, but, but the way I think of it is that um, I think that we have in fact in our world um, two different notions or ideas about say resentment, which I've started to call resentment plus and resentment minus. So um, resentment minus is what I usually mean by it, which is, I think that is um, a reaction to the threat perceived in the fact that you've been disrespected. So uh, if I'm disrespected, that is a hit to, to me, to my status, to my standing. And I respond to that with a with, a, um, with resentment. Uh, resentment plus adds to that um, the following, not just you've disrespected me, but you've disrespected me. And if you had paid attention and tried harder, you could have avoided that. Right. So I think some people do think that, uh, think of resentment as resentment plus. They think not only is it I've been disrespected, but not, but I've been disrespected and you could have, you could have avoided it. Now we could have like resentment super plus, which is I've been disrespected by a free spirit who is inhabiting the material world and you could have avoided it. <laughs> so if you pack all of that into resentment, then yes, we're talking past one another. But um, in fact, what's, 
allowing us to live together, I, I would argue, is just the, is just the narrow thing. Um, and so I think it's not a massive shift. I think it's just a, a refinement to say um, we can give up on the, you, could, you know, uh, you're a free spirit, so you can always avoid this. And we can notice that it's often not true that if you had just paid attention and tried harder, you could have avoided it without giving up on, I've been disrespected. Um, and the case that brings this out, um, I, I think helpfully is the case of the very entrenched so chauvinist or, or, or racist, where it's somebody who, like, it's just not plausible to think that this person, if they had just paid attention and tried harder, could have avoided it. This, this is baked into this person in a way, but it's, I mean, it's going to take, I mean, maybe they could, but not right now. Like, it's going to take a lot of hard work. Um, and yet, it's, it's not okay with me. Uh, it's, still, it's still disrespecting me. It's still something I resent. Right? But my resentment doesn't say, and you could have avoided it. That's not part of it. Um, so that's what I mean when I say, <laughs> um, um, so the question is, is it either A or B? And my answer was yes. Uh, Great. So we're nearly out of time, but uh, um, should discuss uh, the social naturalism because it's you know uh, one of the uh, main novel contributions of your uh, book is to um, right. So there's the, you know back to the resource. So there's this question, uh, you know, whether we should use this resource given that determinism is true. And Strassen's reply. You know, just kind of put bluntly is basically well it's practically inconceivable or something like that uh, and um i mean he says other things like you know the, the about the nature of the the framework of the practices won't allow it that there can be revisions within um including mm -hmm. ones that in involve calibration to the standards uh or the mm -hmm. sorry, to the capacities which we've discussed um but what you know what's the force because it, it can sound kind of weak, just that it's kind of practically inconceivable that uh, to use this resource, but you make a, a case by yeah reference to uh, induction that there's kind of a lot more there. So I'm wondering whether you can yeah, say uh, what the social naturalist strategy is to respond to the, uh, the kind of yeah, use of the resource uh, generally. Yeah. Good. Um, so uh, before I do that, uh, the, there was a follow up to the question uh, which was asked about the um, about the that Str Strassen seems to think that the reactive attitudes justify punitive reactions, and I think that's a a good call. He, he does seem to think that. Um, I think the way to read him is in conversation with someone like Herb Morris, who sees of the punitive reactions as part of what it is to respect people. Um, like, so I'm, I'm going to have things to say about that. I think there's some parts of our condemnatory practices that I think we have to give up, but, but that's not Strassen. But I, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the question, the response to the question. Um, yeah, thanks for noting that. Um, so then your, your, issue, your question was, well, why, um, when Strassen says um, we neither would nor could maybe use the resource all the time, but why shouldn't we? I mean, maybe, sorry, maybe we should, maybe the truth of determinism shows that we should use our resource all the time and treat people objectively. And to that, I think Strassen says, um, somebody who would ask this has failed to understand the purport of the preceding answer, um, namely our commitment to the reactive attitudes. And then I, I, I don't actually back up. I, I look at his Woodbridge lectures and I argue that he's here referring to what he there calls his social naturalism. Um, which in effect is just to point back to this human form of sociability and say, um, what you're asking is whether we should be human beings. That doesn't even make, that's, that's, an, that's an idle question is how, he, is how he would put it, right? This is the form of sociability we have um, and engaging with one another in this way is not the kind of thing that, that can be justified or not. So, I mean, that, that's a really blunt answer to the question, but I think that's, 
I think that is in fact the kind of answer he wants to get. All right. Um, and then there's this worry that gets raised uh, near the end of your book that, uh, well, what if it turned out, because Strassen seems to be relying on uh, the truth of various beliefs of ours when we're engaged in ordinary interpersonal uh, relating, namely that others do display uh, poor quality of will sometimes, a good quality of will, and just other um, basic beliefs that might, you know, uh, might turn out to be false or there might turn out to be certain um, inconsistencies and then sound, uh, yeah, and then Strassen's response given his commitment to a descriptive metaphysics is one thing and then you building on the social naturalism go another way, this kind of existentialist or, you know, uh, you, pr you propose this other view that you're uh, more attracted to, it sounds like, existentialist mm -hmm. social naturalism. So I wonder whether you could, uh, yeah, uh, say something about that. Good, yeah, so this is where I bring in my baseball example. Uh, and uh, so the, the thought again is, um, our practices have had built into them the idea that we're spirits in the material world, <clears throat> and now we learn we're not, so we've, why, would, why wouldn't we give up the practices? Because they are founded on an error. And so I say, well, let's think about um, um, uh, the following analogy. So imagine a nearby possible world in which they play a game called baseball that is very much like our baseball, except for this one has uh, a, a rule book in which it says explicitly that um, uh, in the case in which performing, performance enhancing drugs were used, the game does not count. So no, it was neither won nor lost, no, no stats, nothing contributes to the stats, that game is wiped from the record. And it specifies that the performance enhancing drug is any um, substance that uh, improves performance but leads to long-term de uh, detrimental effects on player health. And then it's discovered that chewing tobacco is a performance enhancing drug. And so it seems as though, we, given the rules, we would have to conclude that no game has ever really been played. So that I think is like the um, learning that determinism is true and thinking that our rule book had in it that determinism is false. Strassen I've already, um, pointed to is gonna say, oh no, what we learned was not just that de um, determinism is true, but also that we were mistaken about what our rule book said. That our rule book doesn't, doesn't really talk about determinism, it talks about something else. <laughs> um, so I, Strassen with, with what he calls his descriptive metaphysics, um, which is his methodology, I, I think that's his response to that. The more existentialist response, which I'm a little more attracted to, would say, yeah, our rule book did say that, <laughs> but um, now that we've noticed the problem, we're not, we're not bound to continue with that rule book. Now, now we're in a crisis and we have to figure out what to do. Um, so in the baseball case, um, we could um, decide that no game was ever played, or we could decide that um, we had the wrong idea of what a performance enhancing drug was, which is what Strassen would have us do. Or we could um, just sort of draw a line at right now and say before, before we're going to uh, allow it and from here on, we're not gonna allow it. And we have to decide which of those we most, which of those makes most sense. Um, and so I think that's the way I think of our situation with respect to determinism that, okay, yeah, maybe some of us did have resentment plus running around or resentment super plus. Um, but now that we understand it, we, we're not, we don't have to give up the whole game. We can um, move forward, um, making sense of, uh, uh, making better sense of what we're doing with, our, with one another now that we have a better understanding of our place in nature. Right, so in the baseball game, it sounds like the, the bodies in charge of the rules will be the ones who make the decisions and probably print out some new, uh, uh, rule books in the practice case, uh, I take it, I mean, 
Are you thinking of it as an actual decision or just the way the practices, uh, you know, evolve and then we could retrospectively say, you know, that was the will of uh, right. the people or something like that in response to uh, what we've right. come to learn. Um, yeah, so, right. Um, no, I think this is a fascinating question because I, I think that these, these attitudes and so the, the demands and expectations that are part of them are um, on the one hand, they're ours. They're, 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 a, they're a part of our culture. Um, uh, they're up to us in some sense. On the other hand, unlike the rules of a game, unlike positive law, um, there's no body that can just change them you know, by decision. So there's, they're a bit more like uh, the meaning of a word or a, or a flag or something where it can change. And in some sense, we can change it, but we can't just do it. We can't, we can't do it by, by, by decision. Um, so, um, and, and so an interesting analogy is actually the, um, in, in my mind is the use of they as now a third person singular pronoun in English. Um, which has emerged as the solution to a problem, which was the, um, you know, the gender, um, uh, that the, the, the making the masculine, uh, the, the so-called neutral verb prioritize the masculine. So um, that's not really the solution. I, I don't like that solution terribly well. It introduced a whole raft of uh, a whole new set of verb singular verb forms that are now indistinguishable from the plural verb forms. <laughs> but, um, but that's, that's what we've done and, and it seems better than where we were. So I'm, I'm, I'm content with it. Um, but it's not something that we could have just declared to doing. Uh, and, or if it was just declared, we would have had to sort of wait to see whether it took or not, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's right. And it's still, I agree, natural to think of it as something we're doing and it will involve kind of local in in intentions so people will and they have you know right written right op-eds kind of arguing for one sort of position right. and you can imagine a similar you know popular books about free will arguing that you know we've internalized these beliefs about uh you know being uh, immaterial souls and yeah and i like that i mean so we are a fish you know so the hour is up mm -hmm. uh if um I want to ask whether you'll permit another question. If you do have to go, but you know, just no, I can I can answer another question. Sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, so there are no more audience questions. It sounds like they're just convinced of the kind of statistically <laughs> ordinary point of the social naturalism. They're mulling over whether they should go existentialist naturalist or not. <laughs> but so my question is: so another interesting thing that happens in the book is in the context of discussing the revisions and modifications that are possible within the practice. Uh, right, so the main thing that the reactive attitudes are sensitive to are the demands, but then you introduce talk of ideals. And I, I found this really interesting and I don't uh, if I fully understand it. So, um, so the ideals are, part, are kind of normative thing that could help to adjust the standards, um, or you forget that last part, but but the question I have is something like this. So given that the society's demands um, and standards you say are determined at least in part by what's statistically ordinary, I'm wondering whether, where these ideals get their reason giving force uh, from, assuming they have such force. Mm -hmm. right? So assuming that an ideal is a kind of standard, a lofty standard, mm -hmm. um, if, the standard isn't at play in the society and it's being at play is required for it's being a genuine uh, standard for it's having normative force. I'm wondering whether you know, it was a transition from ideals being non-actual to actual kind of irrational. And my, my puzzlement isn't just about the, you know, what reasons the majority have to take up the, let's, let's call the person introducing the ideal uh, uh, reformer, you discussed the reformer in your book. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just about the majority, the reasons that the majority have, but the the, re the reformer's own reasons 
Um, I mean, we could, uh, unless she's transported from a different society in which the ideals are actual, then it seems like the, norm, uh, the normative force of the ideals will be derivative of the role they play in her practices. But assuming um, she's kind of lone reformer, um, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, is, is it the kind of idea that gains normative force once it gets uptake, in which, uh, in which case it looks kind of irrational on her part and something like uh, persuasion? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just curious what you, because uh, this, yeah, this idea of the ideals being incorporated into the standards I found really intri intriguing and interesting. And it seemed like something about it was importantly right. Um, because on the one, yeah, because a key part of Strauss's view is focusing on these minimal standards re requisite for society, and then there'll be, uh, yeah, other, you know, uh, demands that we can uh, discuss that are often understood as something like requirements, but uh, yeah, these loftier ideals that the positing which seems necessary to make sense of kind of normative mm -hmm. change or change of standards uh, seems to introduce this worry about normative force that I'm uh, curious mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts on. Good, yeah, so I do think it's a background worry about something called like, like normative force. Um, and it's a, um, it's a hobby, it's a, it's a soapbox of mine that I, that I hate the word normative. I try really hard not to use it. Um, uh, it seems to me it's become a, a kind of technical term that, um, that, that um, leads us to, uh, sorry, it's become a technical term in the service of certain skeptical questions. And I want to um, resist the skeptical questions. So, um, so the skepticism I'm, I'm, I, I do feel is the worry about relativism. Um, and so Strassen has described a kind of anthropological story about how humans have these um, reactions to one another. We care about certain things. Those reactions make set, set up a framework of standards that that framework of standards is going to be um, suited to life as we actually know it. Um, that um, is going to um, allow him to resist determinism, I th but it opens him to the skepticism. Or sorry, it, scratch that. It opens him to relativism. So how to deal with the threat of relativism? Um, I just wheel in ideals, right? I say, look, there's these things called ideals that he's happy with. You know what I'm talking about? Equality. Um, natural beauty, um, the greatest good for the greatest number. I don't know, you pick your ideal, but, but let's wheel those in and we can have those in our culture be part of the, the expectations that we hold one another to. To which you want to say, whoa, whoa, where did, where did those things come from? Where, where did they, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where do they get any normative force? Um, to which I want to re reply, you know, their ideals, like equality. What do you, what, what, what more do you want? Like, isn't equality a great thing? You want to be like, no, I want to know what the force is of it. And then I'm going to ask, well, are you an internalist about reasons? Cause I'm not an internalist about reasons. So I think, so, so basically I'm going to give what I think will be a very um, unsatisfying answer, which is um, I, I have a footnote about this in the, in, in the book. Um, People want to ground these things somewhere. And I never quite understand what work the grounding is gonna do for us, right? So if, if, if you tell me, um, oh, we need, a, we need a norm of equality because it's, it's built into the rational nature and you would, result, you would have a contradiction, you'd contradict yourself somehow if you didn't treat other people the same way you treat yourself. That's sort of the Kantian line as I understand it. You run into a contradiction if you, if you reason in that way. Okay, but like, <laughs> that's not why I care about equality. I care about equality because I think people should be treated as equals, right? I mean, so 
anyway, th there's a point at which I, I'm just going to think that what we need to do is, um, is hold forth about the ideals and why they're good um, instead of trying to address skeptical questions and ground them somewhere else. All right, and that seems the parallel move that uh, response that Strawson has to both the optimist and the pessimist that you review in the book, namely, you know, they should have stopped uh, mm -hmm. you know, earlier than they did. They kind of keep going further back. Um, right, right. That's the Wittgensteinian uh, point that I like a lot. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, that concludes our discussion of uh, this wonderful book. Uh, freedom, resentment, and the metaphysics of morals. Thanks so much, Pamela, for discussing it. I uh, learned a lot reading the book and learned a lot uh, discussing it with you and enjoyed it. Um, thank thank you. you so much for having me. Likewise, I, uh, I enjoyed this a lot and, and found it helpful.